Give to the World Ministries welcomes you to another teaching by Ralphina Dotson. Ralphina Dotson is well qualified to share the message you're about to hear as she lives the principles she teaches daily. As you listen, we trust this message will encourage you, help you grow and develop into maturity as a believer in the kingdom of God. The word you don't know is the word that cannot help you, and the word that doesn't take root can never bring a harvest. Let this message take root in the ground of your heart as you listen to it over and over and take notes. Receive this message. Receive your harvest. Well, hi there. Hi, it's Ralphina. How are you doing today? Oh, I pray you're doing good. I'm doing good today, and I give God praise for that. I don't take uh, life very, um, uh, I take it very, very serious, and I don't take it at all casually. I realize that everything that's going on around me and in me and through me and for me is all the mercy of God and his kindness and his tender mercies toward me. And it encourages me to have tender mercies toward others. I have, um, I had an incident uh, that happened, um, and I'll just give you a little history so that you can understand the attitude that I've had, I was forced to get. I mean, it was like a slap in the face. I tell this story because it's, it happened, and, and, and when it happened, it just challenged me to think about where I am. Um, I had an issue uh, with my foot. I've had an issue with my left foot and leg for years and years, and I was in the rehab for the second time. I broke the ankle on both sides at a meeting up at Dearborn, Michigan uh, back in 2017 and uh, came home and had to have uh, that surgery on that ankle, plates and screws and stuff, and ended up going into a rehab center so that I could uh, get strong and l allow this leg to heal and stay off of it and just a lot of stuff. But just the fact that I was in the rehab center was so disturbing to me because I felt like, well, you know, everybody knows I'm a minister. And how did I get in some situation where I broke my ankle? And this is so embarrassing and it's just so terrible, you know. And so <laughs> I think about it now and I thank God that he's just been so kind to me. He's helped me so much. And um, I just know that he allowed these things to happen for a purpose, but I didn't get it. I was just upset about it all. And the very next year, 2018, I uh, was uh, at a place in Michigan, and I stepped in a kind of a soft spot in the backyard of the pastor's home and tore the anterior ligament of my foot and uh, the Achilles needed to be uh, repaired from this incident. And I was back in the rehab center again. And I thought, oh, wow, this is horrible. I, I'm here two months and I can't use my foot. And I'm, I'm going through, I'm, on, I'm, I'm in a wheelchair. I got a, oh, it was just horrible. And uh, I was just complaining, complaining, and I thought, this is just not fair. And, and I started rebuking the devil, you liar, what are you doing? You're trying to hurt my heart, my family, and my ministry, and my life. And blah, 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 blah. I was just so miserable. And uh, I was complaining and wailing inside. Everybody saw me. They saw, hi, how you doing? But inside, I was just upset, I mean, to the core. And uh, they gave us um, a, a regiment of therapy treatments three times a day. And uh, on this particular day, I had had all three of my treatments. I'd had two physical therapies and one occupational therapy that day. And I was uh, kind of tired and I was going back to my room and it was going to be, uh, I was going to be waiting for dinner or lunch or whatever the meal was coming in. So I was just going to slide out of the wheelchair across a board they gave me because I couldn't put any any pressure of weight uh, from my body on this ankle, this foot. And I got up on the, slid up under this, on this board they gave me to put on the bed and I was going to slide out of the chair onto the bed. And right before I got myself on the position on this board, my wheelchair was ripped from behind. 
And I, I tried to see who was behind me, and the man behind me said, oh, no, no, we got to go. You don't have time for that, and we got to go. And I thought, go where? I said, I've already had all three of my treatments for the day. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He says, come on, come on, come on. We got to go. We, we, we're, we're running behind. And I didn't know who he was or what he was talking about, but my wheelchair was going backwards. And when I know anything, he had twirled me around and was pushing me down this big, long hall, and I get down to the end of this hall and they pushed me in this room and there was another man in that room and uh, me and this man, I tried to make friends with the man a little bit, make him laugh, you know. But I was upset and I was tired and I didn't want to be there. And, but he, he and I were sitting according to direction. I was sitting here and he was sitting adjacent to me. The man pushed me next to this man. So this man and I were shoulder to shoulder. And then they brought in this lady, a little lady. She came in uh, in a wheelchair, and uh, she came in, and she had her hair braided all up, you know, and the braids and the braids all bunded together and a little scarf around her head and everything. And she was holding a cup with ice in it, and she was eating the ice with the first and the third finger. She was eating the ice, picking it up like this, and she was holding uh, this, eating this ice this way, and I noticed she didn't have this, the index finger or the fourth finger. I noticed that. I thought, oh, my God. Oh, this poor lady, she doesn't have fingers. <laughs> She's somewhere. Somebody will tell her, oh, you will talk, she, the lady's talking about you on TV. I noticed that she had two fingers missing on this right hand, and she was trying to eat this ice without these fingers. And I thought, oh, my, I was so sad. I thought, oh, my goodness, this is terrible. And then I happened to notice the cup she was holding the ice in was missing two fingers. And I thought, oh, my Lord, what could possibly have happened to her? Oh, Lord, I was so sad. I got so sad. I thought, oh, my God, I started to pray, oh, Father, Jesus' name, help this lady. And I looked down, and she had one foot in a shoe, but in the other shoe was a pole with a spiral thing around it. And I realized that her, one of her legs had been amputated. And this lady was sitting there eating that ice, and my heart was just breaking. And uh, the man that brought us in, there was another lady in the room who was a therapist. They strung a huge net across it between us, and she was facing us, and we were facing her, and this nurse came to be with her, to be her partner to play, and the man says, are you ready to play some badminton? I wasn't expecting that. I thought I'd play badminton, but okay, what's the point? And this lady screamed across the uh, 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 net at me, and she, <laughs> everybody knows me, knows I'm six foot tall, okay? So I'm not a little bitty person. And this lady said, hey, big mama, you ready for this beat down? I was shocked. I thought, what? What did she say? <laughs> First she called me big mama, and then she told me she was going to beat me down playing badminton. So at first I was kind of, I'm still overwhelmed with the condition she was dealing with. And so I was letting her spike her badminton thing back and forth at me. It was a balloon or something, you know. And she was spiking it toward me. And, uh, and I was sitting there thinking, and I thought, well, this lady can go anywhere and say, ooh, that big lady uh, beat me to death playing badminton. But I who claim I love the Lord and that the Lord loves me and that I'm in the ministry and I've been around the world and I've got power to, to, to rebuke demons and I'm strong in the Lord and the power is mine. How am I going to let a lady with one leg and six fingers beat me? So I thought I can't go no place and tell people, well, the lady that had one leg and six fingers, she beat me playing badminton. I realized I couldn't go any place and tell anybody that. So I decided that I was going to win the badminton game. Well, I did. I did. I beat the lady, you know. I, I asked the Lord to forgive me if that was cruel. But I just felt like it was a poor res 
reflection of who I am and who I'm, I know I am and what I could do if I let her beat me because I was sad and pitiful in her behalf. When I got back to my room and I laid down, I thought about it. I thought, that's me. That was me. I'm thinking I'm sad and pitiful because I'm in the rehab again and my leg is another problem and they had to do surgery again and it's not fair and I'm doing work for the Lord. I thought, we complain and whine too much. We've got to stop complaining about where we are and what we're going through. We've got to start seeing ourselves as people that God trusted in this hour, in this day. This is a, a serious time for God to have at, advantage of us being in the earth. There has to be an advantage to God for us to be saved. There must be an advantage to God. I mean, we get, we get, we get eternity and we get saved and we get, but what does God get out of us? We have to be evident of his greatness and his might and his power, his love, his mercy, his, all the things that God makes available to us that should be evident in us. He should get that back from us. The talent you have, you should give that talent back to God. Oh, yeah, we got the people that's doing the shakedown and the wiggle worm and the terrible stuff. And we, we got the people who have talent. And their talent is contaminated because they're addicted to drugs. And they become overwhelmed with spirits of alcohol and perversion. Uh, they have uh, intercourse and involvement with all kinds of people because they need something to dull the sense of their misery. The actors that read the scripts that are written by people that are demon-possessed. There's no way you can come up with movies, some of the movies that the enemy has, has put out that, that show demonic ad, ad, adversities, demonic manifestations, demons, people doing evil things, people seeming to be insane, insatiated with murder and blood and gore and horror. There's no way you could write uh, a Harry Potter without having some demonic in interaction and influences speaking into your ear. There's no way you could write all these uh, scripts to all these horrible monster creature movies where something is coming from the dead and coming up out of the air and monsters are, and, and spirits are coming at you and aliens are destroying it. How do you get all those thoughts in your head? Where would they come from? Would God give them to you? Absolutely not. So these people that are, are paid a large amounts of money, they make these evil movies and they do these evil things and it looks just great to them because they make money. That's Satan's way of keeping them doing his evil, entertaining the thoughts and, and manifesting the, the images that the demons that have been assigned to them with an assignment to use the gift God gave them so that they present to the world something that glorifies not our God, but their God. I just know it's time we, we woke up. I know it was time for me to quit complaining. I know it was time for me to quit whining about my situation. I was in a place where I could write some things and, and have some things come to me, things that I could use. Oh, I, th I think about all the things the Lord has shown me over the years, how I could live for him and how I could and, 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 and describe the urgency of the world to receive the truth. The almost defying, overwhelming saturation of the plan the enemy has to use the bloodletting practices we see. Oh man, every movie, they, they, they must have 100,000 bullets, sounds that go blood. They make artificial looking blood. They make blood so it look like real blood and it's splattered everywhere. They show you the gory remains of some character that's killed or maimed or destroyed or eaten or whatever it is. Oh, our, our society thinks nothing, nothing of aborting a baby, full-term baby, a baby that's already born. They've already decided that's okay. But they want you to be the saddest person in the world over a puppy. Oh, here's this beautiful puppy. Send $19 a month. Send my... Why aren't they neutering these animals that got so many of them? 
No, they're not neutering animals. They are, they are breeding animals so that they can be used in these last days. These animals are being bred, got chips in them that will cause the, child, the, the animal to talk a certain way and act a certain way, do a certain thing upon what program they've decided. Oh, the conspiracy theorists of the world, you all crazy. No, we just happen to know what the word says. Listen to this. In Malachi chapter 4, listen to what the word says. For behold, the day will become that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yes, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. Oh, it's, it's time. So you, you get the Grammy and you get the Actors Guild and the Oscar and the, you, 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 know, you get the, all the different stuff. But you have a heart that's cold toward God. And you can say and do anything because you have First Amendment rights. You can say what you like. But your words have caused people to fall from grace, people to be deceived and drawn off the mark of their gift, their calling. Oh, yeah. And, and then after, you, after you've destroyed hundreds of thousands, millions of people's lives with the image you presented, that, and you were glorified and turned them into idol worshipers while they raised their hands and stomped their feet in a beat to your music, and your music was inspired by the devil, and he torments you day and night. That's the reason you have to stay drunk or hide so that you can deal with it all. Oh, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. That it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now, whenever I think about uh, roots and branches, I think about a tree. And most of us, we have family and we have relatives or people that are closely associated to us. And it, with a tree, there's a, there's, a, there's a root and the branches are the people that are extended out of our lives. They call it a family tree. I know you've seen that, that, that kind of physical presentation of what bloodlines look like. But what you're doing, if you're not aware that you are drawing the people in your family to share your blood off the mark, you are drawing them into a place where they can follow your example to destruction. And I think about how many people have, have ended up, you know, there, there are generations in the same family in prison. The grandfather's been in prison for years, the father's in prison, and I hear the the son is in prison. The grandmother's in prison. The, the daughter's in prison. The granddaughter's in prison. We, we, we found ourselves following this thing off into a place, and the root, the root is destroyed, but the branches are too. Our understanding has got to come to a place where we realize there was a plan of redemption. God sent his son into the earth so that he could walk through the earth and leave a legacy of light and hope by his example and by his sacrifice make provision so that you would not have to suffer the pangs of death and end up with an eternity that's totally separated from God. You were made in the likeness of God. We've been deceived into being a place where we look like the devil, and that's not God's plan, so he sent a help. He sent a hope. He sent a destiny for us. It says, but listen to this. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And boy, 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 do they have the stories. They, everybody wants to tell their story. I have a story, you know. You need to tell your story. You need to design these clothes. You need to write this song. You need to do this hair to cut and hair do. You, you know, you need, to do, you need to build this house. You need to tell your story. You need, this, you need to write this book. You need all about your story. But you don't ever get to the point where you realize that your story is not the point of your listed. It is the seed from which you develop a consciousness of the faithfulness of God to deliver you from that place to the place where you can be. Oh, healing in his wings. Oh, we, we, can't, we never have healed. I'm still wounded because I was raped. I had a lady call me on the phone years ago for prayer. 
Oh, Sister Ralphina, I just need prayer. I need prayer. And I said, I, I, I'll, I'll be glad to pray. I said, what are we praying for? She said, oh, Sister Ralphina, I was molested. I was molested so many years ago. I was molested, and I just don't seem to be able to recover from it. And I said, what, when was this? 42 years ago. 42 years ago, you were molested. Yes, ma'am. And you can't recover from it? No, ma'am. I said, darling, 42 years is a long time to be raped. Every time you bring up this old memory of the rape, of the abuse, of the violation, you give glory and honor to the memory that torments you. You're going to have to figure out a way that you can separate yourself from it. You got to let it go. You got to give it to God. You got to open your heart so that God can take it away. But you see, your, your psychiatrists, they don't want you to do that. They want you to live it over and talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and go through this monstrous experience over and over and over again. Do you have any idea how? You live in the tormenting experience of yesterday over and over just keeps you in a state where you're bound to something. And so you drag this memory, which is a big monstrous thing, along everywhere you go. And if you were just smart enough to say, well, it happened and I recovered and I survived. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for bringing me past that point and cut the chains on it and leave it in the past. If we could do that, boy, we could find ourselves healed. He said healing will come in his wings. It's going to be lifted. And we shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. There's a translation that grow up like fatted calves in a stall. You know, when you, when you fatten up a calf in a stall, he don't have to roam around outside on, on in the rain and in, in the weather, the wind and the cold and the heat looking for some grass. He's in a stall. All he has to do is wake up and somebody hands him the food that he needs. He gets to eat the, 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 the hay and he gets to eat the, the vegetables. He gets to eat the stuff that they bring him so that they can fatten him up. He doesn't have to scour and grunt and, and fight for blades of grass. He doesn't have to do that. God doesn't want us somewhere diminishing our value in our own sight by putting up with all kinds of stuff, dealing with the inferior form of living. Listen to this. Hallelujah. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in that day, that I shall do this, saith the Lord. But, you know, here's a, a real serious thing here, and I want to speak it here. It says, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Hebrew, and all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Now, he said turn the heart of the fathers. When uh, you look at the statistics about um, how many unwed women, uh, unmarried women have babies and have abortions, somebody fathered the birth of that child and has abandoned the woman and the baby. Yes, you go into prison, and uh, we did ministry in prisons for a long time, and we talked about how can we get you to recover from your past, all of them needed to recover from their past. And 75% and, and of them had issues with their father. I'm just going to say it because I believe it's true. Return the hearts to the fathers. Hearts of the father to the children. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. If you're a man and you know that you have father children and you have no response to them and no concern or you have concern, but you've allowed time to pass and you don't know how to recover. You don't know how to let yesterday go. You don't know how to yield uh, to the feeling of guilt and shame that you carry. You need to reach out to those children and let them know they have someone who cares for them and who will do 
everything that they possibly can. You will do anything to, for them, love them, help them, encourage them, speak life to them. That's important. A father is the most important thing in the world. There are people who don't understand the power and the love of God because of the father they had naturally. How can my heavenly father, who I've never seen, be so great when the natural father I saw twice abandoned me? God wants you to realize if you're a father, be grateful that you've been given that privilege. If you're a father, look for a way that you can mend the fences that have been broken, that you can repave the bridge that separated you because of uh, some confusion, some relational breakdown between you and the mother. Whatever the circumstance was, as a man, come back to being the father of the children that are in the earth that need the help and hope only a father can give. It doesn't say mothers. Mothers seem to hang in there some kind of way. And not all mothers are good. Don't misunderstand me. But there are more mothers involved in developing a person's life than there are fathers. And some of you fathered places, this place, that place, this place, that place. I met a young man once that had 20 kids. He was only 28 years old. He was involved with five different women and he had all these kids. And um, he just was devastated because he didn't know what to do. I said, you're going to pray that God send labors across their path and that he will open a window or a door of opportunity for you to ask to be forgiven, for you to repent, and for you to start to be an example of hope and light and show them what they don't want to do because of the mistakes you made. I'm just interested in us coming to a place where we're prepared for these end times. They're coming up on us so fast, it's not even funny. We're looking at every kind of evil expression and imagery because the, Satan knows he doesn't have long. And he knows that the only place he has to be concerned about is the, the deceitful and the ignorance of the church. He's got to keep us darkened and, and confused and out of alignment and still and intimidated. Well, now's our time to rise. God bless you. We're going to get to do some more of this soon. Have a good day.